if a missile will hit the building the opposite side of the street, three things are likely to happen. Some of you will probably immediately try to run. You will perhaps walk out and see if you can help. But probably most of us will take out our cell phone and make a photo or a video of what is happening. And that's okay, that's, that's the, the times we live in. But in Iraq and Syria, this is the daily reality. Innocent people witness airstrikes. And the same thing happens. Iraqis and Syrians also have smartphones. They see what happens, they take a photo or a video, and they post their story online. My name is uh, Kun Klusin, and I'm a conflict researcher for Air Wars. Um, and me and my colleagues, we collect these stories from local journalists, activists, and people who are simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. And these ten thousands of tweets, Facebook posts, uh, YouTube videos, photos, they tell a very clear story. Uh, a story that is the opposite of the image that is being portrayed by the countries that drop these bombs. That modern conflicts are clean and precise, proven by the stories and the images we know from the news, from the dust cloud at the horizon, where exactly the right people and the right targets are hit. And that's nonsense. At that dust cloud, there's, there's chaos. You can bomb as precise as you want. You always have innocent people as a, as a victim of these airstrikes. And not just six or seven. According to our data, the US-led anti-ISIS coalition <clears throat> has killed 6,238 innocent men, women, and children. 6,238. <coughs> and that coalition, that is us, Belgium was part of that coalition. So, in my presentation, I would like to go into how we collect our data, how we do our work, uh, go into a specific Belgian case, um, and perhaps um, give, an, give a, a good practice example to perhaps end on a more positive note, if that is possible. So we use a very wide range of sources. These can include international and local news agencies and NGOs. And these reports are often very uh, fragmentary. So instead of a local, uh, sorry, instead of a regular news report, details of a fatality might appear on a Facebook martyrs page or in an Arabic language tweet, as you can see behind me. And the tweet reads, a picture showing the destruction caused by the air raid on the town of Bakras Tahtani, near the palace school from the road Badia at noon today. So already at, at, in one single tweet you can see how much information is there on uh, the, the, the time of day and the location. So most if not all of these sources have uh, affiliations to one side or another of the war. So we as researchers need to be very aware of who they are affiliated to and kind of view the news through that lens. It doesn't mean that the information is not correct. It's just even more important to try and find multiple sources relating to that specific event. On occasion we also include links to militant and terrorist propaganda if they are directly re related to an event. 
but we always very clearly mark it as such. So if we use uh, the ISIS propaganda wing Alamak, we will very clearly mark it as propaganda. And these affiliations are not always as clear. So we kind of need to figure them out through the kinds of posts they write. So here you can see an example of, of our rough archive. Um, so you can see two separate incidents, S1309, S stands for Syria, and S1314. It is just a very small part, just the top of an incident um, <coughs> due to the, the, um, the imagery we work with. Uh, it's not uh, smart to show you that. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea of how we work with all the different colors stand for different researchers. So every time, every incident, every source is being evaluated by at least two, sometimes three, even four different researchers. Um, at the top, for example, you can see contested. So we assess the sources and we make an evaluation if the incident is reported as fair or poor or contested. These were both, I think, reported, uh, assessed as contested as both Russia and the coalition were identified as uh, the culprit. And if there is any confusion or if there's any <coughs> clarification needed from the sources, for example, the one on the right is a good example. Euphrates Post posted um, a report on an incident. Later, one of our researchers found a comment on that Facebook post from a man who claims to be a local of, this, uh, of the town that was targeted. And he clearly does not agree with what Euphrates posted. Um, so in such a case, we would, for example, reach out to that man asking uh, for more details. And all of this would be taken into our assessment of that specific incident. So you can kind of see how we work and how, how <coughs> detailed we scrutinize every source. Especially in Belgium, we've been sometimes been attacked by certain MPs for not uh, being detailed enough or doing our work. You know, fumbling around with Facebook posts, um, we, we take our work very seriously. So we will reach out for clarification where possible with local and international NGOs and with the agencies in the region. So we communicate directly with them to verify details. Um, and this is also important to have a, a direct relationship with the people telling their stories. And it's good to build trust and understanding. We will also check with uh, the coalition find out if they were operating in a particular area or not. So if a source claims that the coalition was flying in that area, we will check with coalition sources if that in fact is the case. So some sources will write posts that eventually turn out to be untrue. But they will report an incident as having happened on one day when in fact it's an old incident they will use old photos claiming that the event took place recently. But monitoring these sources every day, you, you get a feel of which ones are more accurate, or which ones are more propagandizing. And often the difference is very subtle. The importance is that sources are reliable in combination with each other, as opposed to individually. These are two satellite imageries from the old city of Mosul. The left side is August 2016, and the right side is the complete destruction in August 2017. And I uh, 
I borrowed the, uh, the imagery from Christian Tribut from, uh, from Bellingcat. Um, so this is, this is partly the result of the, of the 29,000 munitions being dropped in that, in that general area. And to date, the coalition has acknowledged its involvement in the deaths of 352 civilians during the battle for that city. Now, based on local reporting, and these confirmed coalition strikes in the near vicinity, we conservatively estimated that between 1,066 and 1,579 civilians likely died from coalition air and artillery fire during that nine-month battle. And interviews with more than 20 journalists and aid workers strongly support the view that many thousands of people died during that battle. And perhaps more importantly, their reporting showed that simply speaking to locals can uncover very important and specific details. And I, I, I'd like to, to uh, focus on this, this speaking to locals. It's something that the coalition and American authorities confirmed to us. They don't do it. As a matter of fact, it's official policy not to talk to locals. This is perhaps also the time to zoom in a bit on uh, the Belgian mission. I do that at this slide because especially at the start of the second mission, uh, Belgian strikes clustered around Mosul. Until June 2017, 48% of Belgian strikes um, were focused at this hotspot of uh, reported civilian casualties. Still, Belgians insist that they only engage in airstrikes if they are absolutely certain that they will make no civilian casualties. And unfortunately, these kinds of strikes don't exist, especially not in such densely populated areas. <coughs> As Willem mentioned, uh, following the rules of engagement doesn't mean that civilian casualties will not be made. Most civilian casualties are being made in airstrikes that follow the procedures, follow the rules of engagement. So th there, there is a bit more information uh, given from uh, from the, the Belgian military, as you can see from the nice logo on the slide. This is not my slide. I would not use words like points of interest, <laughs> which is also a confusing uh, 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 word, by the way. Uh, points of interest also includes intelligence. Um, so the. I, I, I'm using this slide as uh, the, the, mun the munitions Belgians have used also don't seem to support the, the very firm claim of no civilian casualties. Um, so the types of munitions used are all above 500 pounds, some of even 2,000 pounds. And as Willem already pointed out, uh, the, the Belgians said that they would uh, buy the GBU uh, uh, 39s, uh, small diameter bombs, uh, known for their small impact, um, but also with, with some danger that forensic architecture has made it very beautiful, is not the right word, but well researched video about um, some of the Belgians to, to have, have not. Uh, to my knowledge, have used this 250-pound small diameter bomb. So, one one statement by uh, General Van Sina uh, noted that the Belgians do not have a need to check data about this war every day. That might just be the nature of the Belgian people. Not my words. General von Sina's words. This is one of the transparency tables I made, because everybody loves tables, of course. 
uh, and I slightly updated it um, for to to have the four active members in there: UK, France, the Netherlands, and the US. I added Australia because it, I will later come back to that because it's it's the good practice example. And of course, uh, Belgium, right at the bottom. <coughs> um, Fina already went into the, the, the matter of transparency. Um, but to, to slightly go into the title of, of tonight's event, what we should know about our bonds. Well, this is, this is basically what we, would, what, what we would like to know about our bonds. So the frequency of reports is occasional. As Fien said, they say it's every month. Usually it comes down to once every two months. Uh, there is a, a, there usually was a press conference uh, that my, uh, my colleague would go to. Um, but since July 2017, there has been no press conference where they share any information. Um, so sometimes they, they did, during those press conferences, uh, give some information on locations. That, that's why we, for example, know that 48% of the airstrikes were, were around Mosul. Um, but it was, it was very broad. It wasn't a, a near location given, it was close to the border of Iraq and Syria, or uh, a percentage of how many airstrikes in Syria, how many airstrikes in Iraq. They didn't say we bombed close to Abu Kamal, for example. So no dates of strikes given. The only date we have is through a uh, French document from the France, uh, French government. <laughs> um, so that there is some information on the types of munitions used, some information on uh, the numbers. Well, as, as Willem pointed out, the, the nice circular reasoning of um, there are no civilian casualties because we say so. Um, and there is no transparency of assessment. So we don't know how the Belgians assess that they don't make any civilian casualties. And there is no way, this means that there is no way to check their claim. There, it's a very bold statement to make that you don't make any civilian casualty after almost 900 weapon deployments. And there is no way for us as an organization to check this. We have an archive of almost 5 million words of reports on civilian casualties. With, with this low amount of transparency, there is no way for us to see if what the Belgians say is true. And instead of focusing too much on what the uh, Belgian Ministry of Defense is not giving us. Uh, I, I'd also like to focus on, on what, what a report from, for example, the UK looks like. So this is, for example, a January 8th report, uh, and I quote, a Reaper tracked terrorists maneuvering to the northeast of Abu Kamal and conducted four successful attacks with three Hellfire missiles and a GBU-12 guided bomb. Against extremists on foot and a Daesh pair moving at high speed on a motorcycle across the desert. Two Typhoon FGR-4s were also active over the area on the same day and they used Pavway 4 guided bombs to demolish a building which had been identified as a terrorist command post. That's it. This was part of their uh, weekly update. No insanely detailed tactical information, just what we should know about our bombs. And when we asked uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel Pusse once, uh, he said that the Belgian military was not planning to improve its transparency since it claimed to be 
fully transparent in the parliamentary committee behind closed doors, which is to me a very, uh, two, two things that don't go together, being transparent behind closed doors. Um, and also to, to, to mention that you're planning to not improve your transparency. Um, the, the Dutch are a good example. Uh, we took over from the Belgian uh, defense in January. Uh, and since January, the Dutch uh, include uh, the, the, the near location of an airstrike, which is, it's, it's, we're not fully transparent, but it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction. This is uh, some satellite imagery I, I looked up of the Jordan Air Base where the Belgian and, and now the Dutch F-16s are located. And I looked up some imagery from uh, the 9th of February 2015. So it's, it's quite likely that these are the, the Belgian F-16s. So there have been on, on in, in three um, three times there have been accusations of Belgian, Belgian link to civilian harm. And in two of these cases, um, it was proven that, in fact, Belgium was not involved. And now in two incidents, uh, it's still up in the air. We, um, we had linked through a high-ranking Belgian military that Belgium may have been in, in, uh, <coughs> responsible for a civilian casualty incident in al -Qaim on February 27th and one in Mosul on March 21st. Um, and this is, still, this is still up in the air. It's still a, a, a yes or no discussion. We still uh, believe that this is true. And the Belgian Ministry of Defense says no. There's also no, no discussion or, or no um, reasoning why. And this is kind of the, the, the default position of, of the Belgian ministry. They either deny or decline to answer. There is no, there's no discussion with monitoring organizations or journalists. As promised, I'd like to uh, end on a, I don't want to call it a positive note, but a, a, a good practice example of how we think a, an adult democracy should, should, should handle. So two weeks ago, um, Australia admitted uh, for the second time responsibility for a civilian casualty incident. So they admitted to killing two civilians, civilians a newly wedded couple, um, and injuring two children during the battle for Mosul. Um, and this is the third admission of harm. Uh, in, the, in the first two cases, uh, uh, Australia actually admitted responsibility for the intelligence it delivered. So this is the first time Australia actually admitted to being responsible for the actual airstrike. Um, and, and to us, it's, it's quite a good example because it, it showed how much research and how proactive uh, Australia was in, in, in the whole research. So it started off by a interview by uh, Amnesty field researchers. They interviewed a survivor of the airstrike <coughs> Um, but didn't include it in their report. And this was a report that was initially slammed for its finding by the US-led alliance, so the US-led coalition. Um, the, the Lieutenant General Stephen Townsend stated, and I quote, I would challenge the people from Amnesty International or anyone else out there who makes these charges to first research their facts and make sure they are speaking from a position of authority. Uh, 
And it turned out it was the coalition who further needed to investigate it. Um, so as I mentioned, Amnesty didn't include this in their report because it was more of, a, of an informal talk with the survivor. But they did pass on the information to us. Uh, and we did some, some, some further research, um, but initially assessed it as, as contested. Um, so we, we weren't too sure about the sources we had. Um, we didn't have a specific date. At the end, it was, uh, uh, it, it turned out to be on May 3rd, but we weren't sure if it was May 3rd, 4th, or 5th. Um, still, in the end, the coalition uh, said that, that indeed it was a coalition civilian casualty incident. And then the interesting thing was that the you know, Australians took the information, which was, as I said, not much and really did a lot of their own investigation. So we had a really proactive stance, and at the end, uh, uh, presented the result. They admitted responsibility. And no angry mob stood to the street, that the sky didn't fall down. They reported on it and, and admitted their responsibility in our eyes, something that every adult democracy should do. So, without transparency and thorough research, you cannot evaluate the effectiveness of a mission. And we hope to see such public scrutiny from the Belgian Ministry of Defense. And then you can confirm, and not just claim, the price uh, civilians paid for Belgian airstrikes. Thank you.